All right, good morning, First Church. Good morning. You guys are pretty lively, even though there's a small crowd of us. I'm glad you guys all braved the weather. Uh, I know that I was not that happy to see snow yesterday. I was like really hoping it wasn't going to stick, and then it continues to just stick. But I'm so grateful that all of you were able to come out today, that you made it here safely, um, and I just want to welcome you to our space. Uh, for anyone who is new here, welcome. Um, just a few logistics or things that you can know about the space. If we need to exit the building for any reason, we have two exits in the back that you can use. Um, the ramp entrance, um, the way you came in, is one exit, and you can also go out the front through the stairs. We also have bathrooms. Um, we have some around the corner down the hallway, and we also have an accessible one off of the Marseille Sanctuary over here. So again, we just want to welcome you to the space. Welcome to First Church. Um, we're just so happy that you're here worshiping with us. So we're going to start our service today with our opening hymn. It's number 567 in the hymnal. It's How Firm a Foundation. So if you can, please rise. And we're going to have Dave over here lead us in our hymn.
Deacons of the month for the month of March are Donna and Alan Benson. They function to meet prayer and other needs as they arise. In the event you can't get a hold of pastoral leadership for your own deacon, they fill the gap. We praise God for his active deacon ministry. Power to the Hill Voter Engagement Day is this Saturday, March 19th. This will be a door knocking canvassing event. The goal is to have as many conversations with our neighbors as possible about voting. This event will start at Christ Lutheran 124 South 13th Street at 945 a.m. There will be an in-person pre-canvas education starting at 10 a.m. Breakfast, food, and beverages will be provided. From 10.45 a.m. to 1.15 p.m., volunteers will be paired together to canvas Allison Hill. All materials provided and a hearty lunch is provided after canvassing. For more information, visit Power to the Hill's website or contact the church office. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you, Lydia. So at this time, um, I'm going to invite you to come from where you are seated uh, to greet one another, uh, welcome each other to this space, um, and just say hi. Uh, since we had some inclement weather, a lot of our members are worshiping from home, which I don't blame them. Um, so be sure to stop by the iPad. Christopher, you can wave your hand. It's the one in the back. You can give them a shout out as you're greeting one another. Um, so at this time, I can just welcome you to come and say hi to people.
responses of prayer. Um, this will be up on the screen. The congregational response is simply here our prayer. That is how I invite you to pray with me. God of the weary and oppressed, you are our true God. Give your strength to those who have fled terror, violence, warfare, and hunger. Embrace your beloved children in the greatness of your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We're going to go into our praise set. And so at this time, um, feel free if you want to pick up an instrument by the welcome table, uh, if you want to stand or sing. Um, but we have Dave and Donna and Alan and Darren and Adi here um, just to, again, um, bring us into another time of worship together.
takes us through times of trouble. You take us through the fire. You take us through the overwhelming flood. And yet you are with us, still that small voice in quiet times, in times when we reflect, when we look to you to teach us and to move us. Lord, be with us this hour. Be honored and glorified by all that we say and do. Might your word lead us onward, making a way into the way of God. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, our precious Savior, in your Son. Amen.
worship a good God, how good right. it is to worship a God that we know that we can rely on, mm -hmm. that we can trust on. God, we just come to you today. I'm grateful that you have brought us here together. Um, I'm grateful that we know that you are going to continue to weave us together um, and to lead us in the direction that you are calling this church um, to, to become, to, um, to be that shalom um, that we speak of, God. Um, so at this time, um, we just we offer things to you, God. Um, we just worship your name knowing um, that because of who you are, because of your goodness, um, the things that we freely give to you, God, you will take um, and make the impossible possible. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And at this time, I'm going to invite up Brother Andy to share with us um, a moment of mission. Morning, church. Morning, morning, morning. So next Sunday, <clears throat> so next Sunday, March twentieth, we have our first special offering of the year, and it's called One Great Hour of Sharing. Um, and this offering empowers the Church of the Brethren's Mission and Ministry Board. And actually, Pastor Zayed is a, is a member of that board. And. Um, but the Mission and Ministry Board includes ministries for Brethren Volunteer Service, Discipleship Ministries, Office of Global Mission, Brethren Disaster Ministries, and the Global Food Initiative, and many others. Um, and here, here are some examples of ministries this offering uh, supported recently. Um, Brethren Disaster Ministries responded to three three critical needs um, that happened all in the month of August 2021. They sent uh, volunteers to help displaced people in New Orleans from who were displaced from Hurricane Ida. Um, they sent volunteers to help people from Afghanistan who were evacuated and brought to the United States. And then after after the 7.2 magnitude earthquake that occurred in Haiti, Brethren Disaster Ministries allocated money to help organize food distributions, provide water, tarps, and supplies to the people of Haiti. The Global Food Initiative last year provided grants to the people in South Sudan, Uganda, and Haiti to support agricultural development to address health and hunger. And closer to home, the Global Food Initiative provided a grant to our church about five years ago to start our community garden. And of course, we have a, we have a long tradition at our, at, at our church with Brethren Volunteer Service, um, providing people to serve at our church and our most current BBSer is, is Marvin. Hey, Marvin. <laughs> um, so as you can see, one great hour of sharing offering, it reaches those near and far, sometimes, sometimes changing the lives of people in our own community, and at, and at other times impacting the lives of, of those we, we may never meet, but who are in need of our compassion. So remember, it's not the size of the gift that we give next Sunday, it's that we give of what we have. Thanks. Amen. Thank you, Brother Andy, for that moment of mission. And so for anyone who will be interested, again, in participating in our special offering next week, there will be envelopes that will be available in the bulletin um, where you can put your offering towards all those great things. Like if, again, if you are enjoying um, having people like Marvin in our congregation um, and being able to do things like our community garden and other um, stuff, uh, consider giving um, for our special offering. So at this time, we're gonna go into our regular offering and I'm going to invite up uh, Cody and Sophina 
They are going to lead us in some special music for our offertory. So again, as you think about um, all the things that God has given you and the different ways that you can give back, um, both with your finances, but also with your talents and your times, um, this time of offering is just a moment to be able to reflect on that. So if I can have the ushers come forward for our basket, and Cody and Sabina will come out and lead us in our special music for today.
scripture prayer uh, with me, friends. Uh, God, thank you so much for the gifts um, that have been freely given today. Um, the gifts of financials, but also the gifts of music, um, and just the gifts of uh, compassion and joy for people who are willing uh, to share those with us. So God, as uh, we have been so blessed uh, with so many gifts, help us um, to use these to be good stewards of that which has been given to us so that we um, continue to be peace builders here, um, to bring about that shalom again that we talk about, God, um, here in Allison Hill and in our communities. So again, God, we are just grateful for that, for what was given, and we just offer back to you, God, um, help us to follow your will. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 All right, and at this time, we're going to have um, time for young disciples. Big. And then after, in the spring, after the, the mating season of the elk, they fall 
flock and the animal is just laying on the ground. And so uh, sometimes if you're really, really lucky, you can find one. And this is what we thought I had. That's what we found. Yes. Where did we find this, Mr. Allen? We found this up in our family's cabin up in Spearville, Pennsylvania. Hmm. It's Do you think this is light or heavy? Heavy. So can you think about an elk who has not just one of these, but two of these? Two of these on his head. How hard is that? Oh, Mr. Allen, I don't know. I don't <laughs> what? Say that again, buddy. Super heavy, he said. Yes, super heavy. Yes. Oh, looks good, Alan. So, super heavy. Yes. But is that amazing that God helped create that on the elk's head? It falls off every February or March. And you know what happens in April? It starts growing again. And by the time we get to next November, he'll have two more huge ones. Can you believe it? Look, these are the two that Miss Donna saw, or three, that are this. Do you see how big those are? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? But it's so amazing that we wanted each of you to have a chance to hold this, okay? Because God is so good and so powerful. He helps us make good choices. He helps create incredible things, and he helps you become unique and whatever you want to be in your world. Okay, let's say a quick prayer and then you can all hold it before we go on to our children's church class, okay? Dear God, thank you so much for these wonderful children. They are unique. You have created each one in your name, Lord. We praise your name for these beautiful children. We praise your name for the creations that you have created, whether elk or deer, the squirrel or birds. Thank you, Lord. You are amazing. You are awesome. It is possible that you can create anything. All good. Amen. Amen. All right, friends. You go ahead and have a chance to hold this. <laughs> okay, stand up and then you can go to your go to your go to children's church there, honey. Oh, there you go. Good job. You whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, 
Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Amen, church. Amen. Church, I invite you to pray with me. Dear God, again, just thank you so much for gathering us here into this space. Um, God, as we enter into a time of meditation, uh, just allow um, the words that are spoken today um, be from you, God. Um, allow the Holy Spirit to move among us, um, that we might have ears to hear your word um, and hearts um, open to receive. And God, you are doing amazing things here. And we just thank you for inviting us to participate with you um, in that, for calling us to be a part of your heavenly family. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Truly, church, it is a joy to be gathered here today. And again, I just commend you all for being able to leave your house, um, to deal with the ice and the snow, because I know that it is still something that I um, am getting used to out here in Pennsylvania. Uh, but today we are celebrating, or we are observing the second Sunday in Lent. And if you can think back all the way to last week, Pastor Josiah talked to us um, about what the meaning of Lent is, and he explained to us that this season is a time of preparation, right? He used the phrase, preparation. He told us that we need this preparation because there will be things of this world that will tempt us and lead us astray from being in right relationship with God and with one another. So if you think back to the scripture reading of last week, it was the story of Jesus out in the desert um, and the devil tempting him uh, to turn a stone into bread um, and to do things to prove right who Jesus was. And we talked all about um, why this season of Lent, this preparation, is necessary for us to be able to navigate those things that will come into our lives and tempt us. And when Pastor Josiah um, broke down what this preparation could look like, he talked about how this often includes the cultivation of different spiritual disciplines. Now, one such practice that is com common amongst Christians during this season is the discipline of fasting. And sometimes that fasting even extends into the practice of giving something up for Lent. Now this form of spiritual practice is intended to strengthen our own self-discipline and serve as a reminder of the sacrifice made on the cross by Christ. Now last week we heard of a variety of different examples about things people can give up for Lent. Some people choose to give up chocolate and coffee other people want to give up watching Netflix or their favorite television show. And a popular one among people my age uh, has been giving up social media. Many, I know, right, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> now many are choosing to put their phones down and take a break from scrolling Facebook and Instagram feeds or watching videos on TikTok. And for many people, the idea of being unable to open up an app and check to see what others are doing sounds like a huge sacrifice. But something that has come up as people take a break from social media, as they fast um, from this, um, is that they found that when they have decided to take a break uh, and step away from these platforms, such as Facebook and Instagram, it's um, a moment of refreshment. It's a time of renewal. One of the biggest opportunities um, that taking a break from social media created for people was a chance for them to step away from the constant comparison that is embedded into life online. We see this comparison, especially as it pertains to things such as our own self-image. And as I've talked about before in other sermons, it's easy to scroll online and become consumed by an idea that your life is supposed to be a certain way, your body is supposed to look a certain way, and that you're supposed to possess certain things. This comparison of ourselves to others is made possible by the hyper-individualistic nature that is found within the culture of our society. And it is this hyper-individualism that prioritizes and even celebrates the singular person over the collective, over the community. 
And that is a way of profiting off of the idea that we are all in need of self-improvement. Right, so if we continue to prioritize the single, the individual, then we see that we need to focus on ourselves, that we need to continue to be pouring into ourselves and improving solely ourselves. And that promise is made to us, our self-improvement can happen if we just focus on ourselves and we work to do the right things or possess the right things. Right, if you were to walk down the aisle of a bookstore, how many self-help books would you be able to find? Right? Now, of course, self-improvement by itself is not inherently wrong. We all have growing edges that we can work on. But it's when our own self-improvement comes at the expense of someone else, that's when we should take a second to question our motives. Strengthening our own spiritual disciplines during this season of Lent is important. But the motivation behind strengthening this should not just be for our own self-gratification, but should go beyond ourselves. So then rather than getting caught up in the self-improvement of ourselves, Paul today in our scripture is instead offering us an alternative perspective here in Philippians. So when we sit down and read the epistle found uh, to Philippians, we can see that Paul is on a mission of bodybuilding. Right now, I'm not talking about right, the individual act of bodybuilding, going to the gym and pumping iron and working out, right? Paul is on a mission of building up the body of Christ. This journey is not the building up of the individual, right, but rather the collective body of Christ. Today's scripture picks up in chapter 3 of the letter. Paul is inviting the Philippians to emulate his life and ultimately asking them to emulate the life of Christ. This, of course, is not a request that is specific to Philippians. We can find the same language used in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when Paul writes to them that they are to be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. As we can see, Paul's ministry stresses the importance of being like Christ. Now, continuing on in our verses today, we also see a structural pattern that Paul often follows. Verse 17 tells the Philippians what kind of positive action they should follow. But then in verses 18 and 19, Paul stresses what the opposite negative action would look like. Right? In verse 18, Paul warns the Philippians that there will be enemies of the cross, and that their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. In verse 19, we are told that their minds will be set on earthly things. Again, looking over these verses, we can see Paul's warning to not get caught up in the ways of the world, to not have our minds set on earthly things. For the Philippians, like ourselves, Paul wants them to see beyond what the world is telling them to see. For those living in ancient Philippi, it was a diverse urban community. There was Greek influence and Roman influence in the society. Many different people and different ways of thinking existed. There was also different political rulers and also different gods people could choose to worship. And when I was looking at commentaries for this particular text, I came across a scene that was constructed by the scholar Walter Taylor. And he paints this image of what it might have been like for an ancient listener to encounter today's text. So Taylor writes the following. So try to picture this. You are a first century Christ believer living in Philippi, a northern Greek city where many gods are worshipped. On your way to this week's time for worship and education, you happen to notice the beautiful buildings dedicated to Egyptian deities. Even more, the temples to the deified emperors Julius, Augustus, and Claudius. They all catch your eye. In your city, often called Little Rome, you also glance for the thousandth time at the many inscriptions honoring all the different emperors. After you crowd into the home of a believer, you are pleased when the leader reads a new letter from Paul. But you have to wonder what he means when Paul writes, our citizenship is in heaven and it is from there that we are expecting a savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So, like our day and age, there were many different options and distractions that the ancient listener of the good news could have chosen to, right? Even on their way to worship, on their way to go and educate, there were things around them telling them to follow a certain way, different gods to choose from, right? Egyptian deities and Roman emperors. And that's similar, right, to our time, where there are countless products to buy and opinions to listen to that promise us our own self-improvement, that promise us a place of belonging. Yet, Paul talks against this. So when we read verse 20 in our scripture, it stands out as a warning against conforming to the earthly promises of other gods and putting our faith in emperors and rulers. But verse 20 also serves not just as a warning, but also as a possibility for hope. Just as mind-boggling as it may have been for ancient readers to understand what this verse could have possibly entailed, it feels like it also has such an impact on our contemporary lives. Again, verse 20 reads, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listening to this verse in light of the events occurring in our world today, with the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia, and with the current reality of displacement for many people, this verse somehow stands out and means something special. In 2021, the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees found that there were 26.6 million refugees worldwide, the highest recorded number. Yet, the number of people who have been displaced because of conflict, persecution, violence, or human rights violations was over 84 million individuals. In a political climate where there seems to be ever-increasing conflict, there appears to be far more examples of people being separated then there are stories about people coming together. So when I finally found a story that it could offer some hope, that could possibly help us to see why verse 20, where Christ is offering us a different citizenship, might be so impactful, when I came across the story, I definitely had to share with you all today. So Timothy Seidel is a professor of peace building at Eastern Mennonite University. He's also a Messiah alum, for any Messiah people. And he's the director of center, director for their Center of uh, Interfaith Engagement. He's worked extensively on the subject of peace and peace building in the context of Palestine and Israel. And in one of his articles that he published, he recounts his time when he went to Palestine to visit a family back in 2015. Now, this family is very special. They're, the family is the Nasser family. And they have lived on their land um, for centuries. They actually have paperwork um, that tells them uh, that the land belongs to them that dates all the way back to the Ottoman Empire. So they have paperwork from the Ottoman Empire, then when the British came, um, and now as they are living on their land, they're having to um, illegally address um, their claim to the land with the Israeli government. So they live in a section um, of land where they have a claim to it, right? They have paperwork dating back all the way to the Ottoman Empire, um, but the Israeli government is telling them, no, this is gonna be our land now. We're going to come and we are going um, to put people on this land to live there for us. And one of the ways they help to clear out families, one of the ways that the Israeli government does that, um, is by cutting off resources to the land. And so where this Nasser family lives, um, they don't have any access to certain infrastructure. They don't have any running water. Um, the roads, they are really hard to get to. Um, and all as a way for um, the Israeli government to kind of force them off of their land. Um, the reason why this family is so special um, is for a number of things. And Timothy Seidel, he notes this in his article. So the first thing that he notes is that the family has chosen um, to remain on their land and has chosen to be steadfast um, in their existence under their land. And um, again, 
The NASA them has chosen to remain despite all the ways in which that they have been tried to be forced off of their land. But the other thing that is super remarkable about this family is not only are they choosing to exist in this space, but when um, Dr. Seidel was walking to go visit the family on their farm, along uh, the path leading up to the entrance of their house, they have a phrase that is inscripted on the pathway in many different languages. And the inscription is, we refuse to be enemies. So in the story that Dr. Seidel notes, he says um, that the family has chosen to remain steadfast, that they continue to live on their land despite the lack of infrastructure and the ever increasing pressure from Israeli forces uh, forcing them to leave that um, their example of steadfastness is an example of resistance to those earthly things that Paul has been talking about. But more so, their steadfastness is strengthened when they choose to live by the principle that they will not be made enemies, nor be forced to see others as enemies. So in many ways, the story of the Nassar family is getting at what this um, scripture in Philippians is talking about today. We're talking about what it means to emulate Christ, what it means to be like Christ. The story of the Nassau family choosing to remain steadfast, but also choosing not to be seen as enemies or to make enemies um, is that Christ-like behavior. And so again, choosing steadfastness and building bridges of peace rather than following promises of individualized greatness um, is what we can see in the story for today. And so again, today's scripture reading helps us to see the importance of emulating Christ's life and love to one another as a way of building up our own communities. As we seek to build bridges in our communities, how can we be sure that we have a firm foundation? So during this Lenten season, we are reminded that the strongest foundation is one set on Jesus Christ, and that this season of preparation can be a time of recentering. And as we have learned today, not only is our foundation made strong by being built on Christ, but it is strengthened when we stand together. So thinking about this idea of building bridges built on a strong foundation brought me to this image of something that I had no idea existed before I moved here to Pennsylvania. And that is a keystone. When I think of what it means Right to have a firm foundation um, to recenter Christ, I think of putting Christ right at that keystone. Um, and what's so important about that keystone is that it's a bridge, right? It's a bridge, it's the connection between two different places. It's the way that we connect the east shore and the west shore here in Harrisburg. It's the way um, that things and goods and ideas are exchanged. And it's a way that we build community. And so in this Lenten season, when we're thinking of preparation, this idea of working on our own self-disciplines. I'm reminded not only should our self-disciplines work, right, to recenter Christ as our own keystone, but our self-disciplines should also help us to build bridges um, where we're expanding our community and we're thinking not only of ourselves, but also of the collective. So if our scripture today is calling for us to stand firm and to build up the body of Christ in order to hold one another up like a bridge, we need a keystone to remind us, we need a keystone like Christ to keep us all together. And again, rather than working on this idea of self-improvement, this Lenten season is also about building up the collective. And because we have a God who seeks shalom amongst God's people, we are encouraged to take up Paul's invitation to not only set, to not set our minds on earthly things, but to take seriously our heavenly citizenship and work towards imitating the life of Christ in our own communities. Amen. Amen. All right, so at this time, I'll invite our praise team back up. And we're going to be closing our worship today um, with the song Cornerstone, which we probably could change to Keystone um, for our context of Pennsylvania. Uh, but again, I just invite you um, to stand if you're able. Um, as we sing this song and think about what it means this Lenten season um, to put Christ at the center, to make Christ our keystone, 
Um, and thinking of, of us a bridge, right? A bridge of building, um, of peace building and of bringing differences together.
thank you so much for sending your son Christ, uh, for allowing us um, to have the season of Lent, um, to be able to prepare, um, to celebrate um, the life of your son, um, to be reminded of the sacrifice that was made. So God, as we leave from this space, um, continue to work within us, work among us, um, that we may be able um, to leave prepared, um, not only for ourselves, but also being mindful um, of those around us and those in our community, God, um, that you want us um, to be with and to work with. So again, as uh, we just leave this uh, place, um, continue to allow your spirit um, to move and allow us to be open to that movement so we can answer um, that call that you have put onto us. We pray all these things in your son's name. And church, you may leave. Go in peace. Oh, that's that's true. Yeah. So uh, you feel free to leave, but also we're going to be having our sermon talk back um, in like the next five, ten minutes. So, so anyone who wants to come and do the talk back, um, we're going to be joined in the first three pews. And anyone also who is on Zoom, uh, feel free to stay. But for anyone else who needs to leave, go in peace and travel in mercies all that I do.